Welcome back to the Red Dust Diaries RPG podcast with John and Hannah. Hi. And today we're cracking open the post bag once more and answering some of your voicemails. And our first message is from my old mate Rob Davis, aka The Swamper, and he's got a few things to say about our recent Frog Hemoth episode. So take it away, Rob. Just listen to your uh, podcast on the Frog Hemoth. Uh, one will probably be appearing in my game tonight. Uh, a small group of bullywugs have erected a church uh, alongside the very end of a river. The river ends in something called a fertile mire, which is like a mucky pond. And the mud is uh, magical in that it can make non-fertile land fertile if spread about, which for reasons I won't go into is useful to the players in this campaign. Um, so anyway, just want to say thanks. Really enjoyed it. And uh, don't worry, John, you pronounced Gygax correctly. Bye. Hi, Rob. Really glad you enjoyed the episode and that we've been able to give you a bit of inspiration. Let us know how the session goes. Yeah, and I'm glad I pronounced Gare Gigax correctly. Thanks very much, Rob. And our next call is from Randy at Biggest Geekers, who's also calling in regarding the Frog Hemoth. Frog Hemoth for the win. Uh, John and Hannah, good choice. That is so cool. I thought it was just me. I had a crazy fascination with that Frog Hemoth when I saw it in the Lost Caverns Sojanth. Um, great episode. Great ideas. Definitely, I thought um, Hannah's idea for you to use it in that sort of pulp action Indiana Jones type game. I mean, that couldn't be beat the Guardian of some ancient Mayan temple. Um, I used them several times, and yeah, they were pretty deadly. My players in general were terrified of them, and probably rightly so. They were just super tough. So anyway, good episode. Take care, guys. Hey there, Randy. Glad you enjoyed the episode on the Frog Hema. It certainly seems to have struck a chord with people. And as Hannah was saying in the episode, and as you said, that monster is pretty much tailor-made for some sort of like pulp action lost world sort of temple vibe you know indiana jones you can't really go wrong with a monster like that because it's similar to something we know but it's also a bit weird as well and has that element of sort of like eldritch horror to it with the tentacles and whatnot so to be honest i can understand your players being a little bit wary of it but thanks very much for calling in dude and next up we have jason Connolly from the nerds rpg variety cast podcast Interesting to hear your thoughts. I appreciate your thoughts and your um, reasoning with Zine Quest. It just gets so expensive. You know, I, I'm i trying to wean off Kickstarter myself. I just blow way too much money on there, and I've got so many games, so much product that never gets used. You know, I need to sell stuff, not buy stuff, to be honest, be brutally honest. Otherwise, when I die in a few years here, my wife's going to have to try to sell all this junk, and it'll probably all just go in a landfill instead of getting going somewhere else. But it's hard, you know, I was looking and even a cursory look, if I picked up some of the things that interest me, you know, that really interest me, uh, you know, I'm easily in the $200 range for printed zines. And even without printing them, I'm still going to end up like $130. It's crazy. Um, and some of these you definitely want printed, you know. Um, so, yeah, I don't know. I'm not sure what I'm going to do yet. I really don't have the money to put towards it. But I really don't want to miss out, which is the insidious thing with Kickstarter. And a lot of these things, especially these are, so RPGs aren't typically as bad because RPGs normally will also eventually show up on drive through RPG. Although the printed products may or may not, but typically all the RPG products are going to get out there in the wild. So now with these zines, it's a little bit different, but I've got a feeling most of this stuff will probably show up. Maybe not some of the weird print things, but the actual, but a lot of the, a lot of these, you can kind of look at them and tell which ones you're going to be able to get later. So maybe that's a strategy for people is if you're pretty sure it's going to show up on drive through later, if they're, you know, if they're fulfilling through drive through, maybe you can not get it during Zine Quest and get it off drive through later. And if they've already funded, you're not hurting the creator by doing that. Right. So in fact, they'll pro but with me, because I'm a board game player, a lot of board games are Kickstarter only. Like they won't, ever be in the retail space they're just on kickstarter and it makes it really difficult because it's a lot of pressure buy right now this is the only time you'll ever get it in your life right and and, and it's really ticked me off and, and it's frustrating and, and it's pressure they're putting on people that that i don't think is well i mean they're not putting any pressure on people we're putting it on ourselves because it's not like anybody's holding a gun to my head and making me buy a board game off kickstarter right but that desire to keep up with the joneses is so strong 
it's I, I kind of think Kickstarter is a pretty insidious thing. It, it came out as a good thing initially. And, and I do think in its purest form, the idea of helping the budding business or the or the new person get something out there. I think it's good. I think these big companies using it as a fulfillment model and a, and a funding model, which you see a lot. You see a lot of big companies using it, putting out these million dollar Kickstarters that are only you know to get through kickstarter you know i think i think there's some skewed things there um i mean they're not doing anything wrong legally so it's not like i can and and even morally they're not really doing anything wrong it's just a business model it, it's just it's a business model that's tough because it you know it really puts the screws to you, you you know with your hobby dollars or your hobby pounds in your case um but you know i don't know it's so i i have not decided yet there's a fair chance i'm gonna drop you know about a hundred dollars on kick on zine quest even though i really don't want to and i really don't have the money to do it so we'll see but yeah it was interesting hearing your thoughts and i look forward to your next episode take care hey jason thank you very much for your calling glad you managed to persevere with speakpipe it's greatly appreciated and yeah i can sort of see what you mean about kickstarter you know the the old thumb screws are on a little bit especially if it's something you can only get on kickstarter i mean i don't have any real experience of like board games because i don't really play them a lot well it's funny you mention that love because i've actually when I was working with the laser cutter, yeah, uh, which that business I was able to start through a Kickstarter, yeah. Um, but I helped um, a couple of board games companies make pieces for their Kickstarter board games. Okay, and it's unfortunate the way these things work. Yeah, that because. Y- how much it costs to manufacture a board game and yeah. how difficult it is to organise getting the cards from the printer and the tokens from the place that you buy and your tokens from yeah, all the and the boxes bits. from the box place and then assembling all of that. People don't want to have like 200 copies sitting around to sell to you later on and shops don't want to have 10 copies of a game that's not going to sell so unfortunately it's what happens what would be really nice would be to have some kind of a digital library where you could print your own version of these sorts of games for a significantly lower fee yeah, I mean, I think we are seeing that a little bit now as like 3D printers are becoming mm-hmm. more commonplace. I've certainly seen people making like digital sculptures available for like printed miniatures and stuff like that. So obviously you could do that with board games. I was going to make the comparison that the thing I like about RPGs is because effectively once you've laid out your book, if you've probably already got it in an electronic mm-hmm. format. So making it into a basic PDF as opposed to printing it isn't that difficult so it's not surprising that most rpgs that are available on kickstarter eventually bung the pdf version up on drive through because that's Mm -hmm. not costing them any extra money really and it may gain them some money because people who couldn't get the kickstarter will probably do that but as you say for board games where you've got pieces and physical components you need to produce you can't really make that available without piling a load more cash in to produce more pieces i think your idea of like 3D printing and stuff like that might well, be one solution going forward. It doesn't forwards. even need to be 3D printing. Yeah. If you're doing a board game on Kickstarter, it would be very simple for you to provide a couple of pages of print at home cut out tokens, print at home cut out board, and yet it'll never look as good as the one that you've made. At least you're about to play it though. And the people that are backing your Kickstarter because they support your game. Are still going to want that like pretty physical version that you've made and your deluxe laser cut version if you're able to get one i'm afraid i don't do that anymore mm-hmm. um but it'd be nice to have that stingy gamer edition that you can give someone like a pound or 50 pence and be able to still play the game still support the thing that they've made yeah, I entirely agree with you. And I mean, again, it's something that could be packaged with that game 
once you actually if you like ordered the the sort of like the big full deluxe game they've already got the image files for the board they've probably mm -hmm. they could probably make some image files for like little tokens that you could print out mm -hmm. so would it be nice with like a lot of these rpgs when you buy like a physical copy you get the pdf with them as well so if they could do something like that like you say the pdf version would in no way invalidate the sort of full deluxe version it wouldn't be as good or pretty but at least you could still play it and it wouldn't just disappear and of course it'd also be nice to have the uh 3d models for your deluxe pieces if they're 3d printed or laser yeah and again that's something all you could all put together in like a batch and bundle with it like on drive yeah. or something but yeah, I do see what you're saying, Jason. I can appreciate how it must be frustrating, you know, if you're a bit of a collector, mm -hmm. particularly in board games. Because like you say, with a lot of these things, you've got to get hold of them sort of now when the Kickstarter's running or, or you're done, basically. You, you're going to have to scour the the sort of eBay and places like that looking for like a second-hand copy, which often have like vastly overinflated prices. Yeah. And if it's a game where they bring out expansions for them, if you just happen to miss one of the Kickstarters and you're trying to get yourself a complete set, then it might cost you a lot or might be very difficult afterwards. And I mean, I'm glad I don't really have to do that myself because like I'm not a big board gamer. But I do also have a little bit of sympathy with the companies because even like the massivest like RPG or board games companies aren't sort of humongous companies when you think about the grand scheme of things so for them having a kickstarter is a way of making sure they've got the funds before they start putting their stuff together and as hannah said they don't have a warehouse full of board games that they can't shift and uh, um, what really annoys me about this is that the people that i know that have created board games would happily spend their entire life manufacturing individual personalized copies for every person who wants to play their game because they're so thrilled that someone wants to play their game they're quite happy to share the game with them but everything else in making that happen gets in the way yeah, I mean, certainly the, the sort of like independent board game creators, for like one of a better term that we've met at like UK Games Expo and places like that, when we've like played a few of these little test games, as you say, love, the one thing that always strikes us about them is they're always like really enthusiastic about whatever their game is, yeah. and they're just glad to be having people playing it, and they're like over the moon when people are enjoying it. And much the same with the stuff you've produced and the stuff I've helped you produce. Yeah. When people buy it on Drive Through RPG, we are thrilled when you pay more than a penny for it, but if you pay a penny for it, we're still thrilled because yeah. you bought it. Because you, you're hopefully you, enjoying it. You enjoyed using it, hopefully. Yeah. So, so I don't know if we've laid down any wisdom there for you, Jason. I don't really think I have a, a simple answer, unfortunately. Because, we have no solutions, yeah, cause, I mean, we agree. It's a bit crappy, isn't it? Yeah, because I mean, the, these companies, <laughs> at the end of the day, they, they've in order to continue producing products and paying their employees, they've got to make money. And when you're in like a niche sort of hobby like board gaming or RPGing, mm -hmm. you've got to sort of proof yourself against losses and excess stock as best you can. And Kickstarter provides, I'm sure it's not the only one, but it provides an avenue of doing that and minimising the risk to the company as a whole. So you can't really blame them for taking it. And last but by no means least, it's my old mucker Pete Jones from our days on Purple Worm and who also runs the excellent podcast and it's now on YouTube as well, I believe. Dragons are real, so check that out if you haven't already. So, what have you got to say to us, Pete? Love your episode on Zine Quest. I tell you what, there's some great zines out there this year, isn't it? Oh my, what it is heaving under the pressure. And as you said, it's uh, you've got to watch out for that post and packaging because that can be a killer. And there's a few that I want on print, but I'm not paying fifteen, twenty dollars to have it shipped. I'll have to print it myself. But it's great seeing what all the uh, other anchorites and other podcasters are choosing for their zines. So um, thanks for that episode, and uh, I'll speak to you again soon. Hey Pete, thanks very much for your message. Yeah, as people will know if they listen to our episodes, our Zine Quest three episode, which released last Monday was inspired by Pete's own episodes. I believe he's done four or five episodes mm -hmm. now, just highlighting various RPG zines that are being released as part of Zine Quest 3 on Kickstarter. But yeah, as Pete said, especially with the postal system and things being as they are at the minute, 
that uh-huh. PMP can be an absolute killer. For some uh, reason, it's suddenly a lot more expensive to get books from overseas. Indeed. <laughs> and as a result, as I was saying in our episode on Monday, I've pretty much scaled down all but one of my um, zines, so they're only in PDF format, just because that's the only way I could afford more than a handful without it getting prohibitively expensive. And as Jason was saying in his earlier call, mm-hmm. I ain't got a couple of hundred like dollars or pounds or whatever, whatever your yeah. poison is, to drop on zines. But I do still want to support people who are releasing stuff, mainly for RSR games in my case, because that, that's my wheelhouse. But I do still want to support those people who are doing things like that. And as we were saying about the board games, who are passionate about the stuff they're releasing. So even if I'm only chipping a few quid to each one for a PDF, at least I'm still sort of throwing my hat in the ring and showing my support. And I'll get some cool content at the end of it. And as Pete was rightly saying, because they're zines and they're only fairly small as mandated by the sort of like the Kickstarter criteria for Zine Quest, I can always print them out or I can go on Lulu or something like that, print them out, or I can use my home laser printer to do that. And it'll probably save me a bit of money or at least I can just print them out eventually and I don't have to lump all that money down in one big lump sum. Especially not when I'm going to be paying Mm. almost as much again or sometimes more for the PMP as I'd be paying for the actual zine. And I love supporting people who are doing content, but I don't like throwing my money away for like ridiculous PMP. It's a real shame. Yeah. I mean, luckily, last year I was able, before before the, the price hikes, I was able to back sort of like four or five in physical, mm-hmm. and it wasn't too ridiculous. But this year, I thought it's better to back a few more on PDF and spread the support around than it is for me to buy like two or three, still pay like the same amount of money, and only have like three zines. The only one I've really kept on um, print is Tim Short's um, one. He did the, the Hunters in Death one last year with the um, the sort of Needleman inspired thing in it. And he's doing a, a sort of tomb based adventure this time, which I really like the sound of. So, And his PMP was pretty damn reasonable by oh, comparison no, to a lot of he's people. In the UK. No, he's not, he's in the no. US. But his PMP was pretty reasonable, so I've kept that. And again, due to the quality of the stuff he puts out, I had no hesitation in keeping that as like my one print copy. But I'm still looking forward to getting the PDFs of the others. And like I say, you can print them out if you want to. So that's it for this episode. Thank you very much to all our wonderful callers. That's Rob Davis, a.k.a. The Swamper, Randy from Biggest Geekers, Jason Connolly from Nerds RPG Variety Cast, and Pete Jones from Dragons Are Real. Thanks ever so much, guys. It's always great to hear from you. And if you would like to get in touch with us and maybe be featured in a future voicemail episode, maybe you want to suggest something for a future episode that you'd like to see, comment on an episode we've already done, tell us a funny story about your gaming group, or just have a general chat. There's a couple of ways you can do that. You can leave us a voicemail message on SpeakPipe. There'll be a link in the description of this show. Or you can send us an email to rdrpgpodcast at gmail.com. Until we speak to you again, take care. And whatever you're playing, stay safe and have fun. Bye. Muscling through speak pipe. Because you abandoned anchor, you left us strong. Nobody likes a quitter. Okay, I'm just giving you a hard time.